It was so awesome. Cambridge got to host 150 people from seven different countries at their home facility in Chesterfield, Missouri. is Ron High School. And I did not know Ron before this conference. Uh, I, I had uh, a request to speak and I said, who is this guy? I don't know him. And I called Paul and I said, who's Ron? And he said, oh man, you're gonna love him. And so I got to meet him and get to, got to know him a little bit and got to explore what he does and how he shares. And so I'm excited for you to hear his story. One of the, there was only three requirements basically of speakers, 15 minutes long, and they had to share something practical of what their actual experience is. We didn't want any theory. And so I think Ron could teach us a lot in theory, but he's going to share a practical, how he learned from his own experience, which is the way that I learned the best, a story about how his heart was changed and learned about lean through his own personal exploration of it. So I'd love for you to welcome Ron High School from uh, Reduced Effort. <laughs> Yes, great. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Hopefully I have something that will help you. Um, this is a common definition of lean. <clears throat> lean is simply a production practice of searching out all activities that do not create value for the end user, which is considered waste, and then eliminating those wasted activities. This was the definition of lean that we used in the world-class manufacturing group when I worked at the Clorox company, and looks pretty good. I think this definition is wrong, and I'm going to share with you how I came to that conclusion. So if you Sticks. Um, here's some drumsticks. Um, how long do you think drumsticks last in the hands of a hard rock drummer? How many minutes do you think in the average play time of these sticks before they break? Five minutes. Yeah. Well, five minutes, yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes it cracks the first time you hit it at the edge of a cymbal. Actually, it's about 20 minutes average time. So I thought, well, I'm a drummer. I can, uh, I can figure out how to uh, make a a synthetic drumstick that will last longer and drummers won't have to keep throwing away all those wasted drumsticks as they break. And so I set out to, uh, to design a new synthetic stick. Now synthetic sticks had been developed before, but drummers typically picked them up and threw them, threw them down right away because they didn't feel right. They didn't feel like wooden sticks. Basically it was because the, the center of gravity was incorrect. So I spent about three years developing a synthetic drumstick. By the way, that's me in, in the 70s. <laughs> My wife made me put that in there. <laughs> nice hair. <laughs> I think that was at uh, Fillmore Auditorium in San Francisco. Um, anyway, um, so I controlled the center of gravity by changing or varying the inside diameter of these. These are actually hollow. And so by, I could make the outside diameter the correct outside diameter and control the center, the center of gravity by varying the inside diameter. So it took me about three years to develop this. And so I knew they worked, but I hadn't shown it to any other drummer yet. So it was time to show it to some other drummers to see what they thought about it. And so I looked in the newspaper, I saw that the Oak Ridge Boys were playing in town, and I knew that the Oak Ridge Boys drummer was Fred Satterfield, so I picked up the phone and I called hotels. Can I talk to Fred, Fred Satterfield? Never heard of him. <laughs> Can I talk to Fred Satterfield? No reservation for Fred here. Can I talk to Fred Satterfield? Just a minute, I'll put you through. Great. Hey Fred, my name is Ron, I'm a drummer, I've invented a new drumstick, I'd like to show it to you and get your opinion. He said, come on over, I'll introduce you to the boys, and I'll take a look at your sticks. I went over there, he picked them up, immediately liked them, and said, I'm going to use these tonight. How many tickets do you need for the concert? I said, I need two, 
everybody thinks I took my wife. No. <laughs> I called a guy that I knew that worked at a television studio and I said, look, I can put you on stage with Fred Satterfield, the Oak Ridge Boys tonight, filming this whole concert, and you're going to film them using my sticks, and then we'll get an interview afterwards. He said, great, I'm there. <laughs> this is a picture of Fred Satterfield. He played with the Oak Ridge Boys for 20 years, Grammy Award winner. This was the, drum, the uh, drummer for Styx, John Panazzo. I started showing him to other drummers, and they started giving me their opinion of him. He was using them in concert as well. You can see, I don't know if you can see it, but they, they were brown. They were the only brown sticks um, made at the time, so that it would be obvious that they were using my sticks. I turned on television one day, saw this. in our music, which led to our very first pure country hit. Maybe you'll remember this. Ooh, that slide didn't come out. Let's see if the next one. Oh, there. That's interesting. Anyway, Fred said, I can honestly say that the balance of the high skill sticks is the best I've ever felt. I'm really surprised it has taken this long for someone to come up with a stick that felt like wood but would last longer. David Garibaldi, drummer for Tower of Power, they were durable, matched, and balanced well. I like them. Mike Stevens, he played with Paul Williams, uh, Cher, David Bowie. The high skill sticks allow me to play with confidence because of their durability and superior balance. They sound good on drums and cymbals. Uh, Ed Shaughnessy, the drummer for the Johnny Carson Tonight Show. Best synthetic sticks I've ever played. The Hercules of sticks. Touchdown! I know what I'm doing the rest of my life. <laughs> so I thought. One day I put all the sticks in the back of a big truck, drove out to the local landfill, I pushed them out of the back of the truck, and I watched for three hours bulldozers covering all that inventory up with dirt. This was, it took me years before I could even tell this story. I mean, all of our money was put into this. My wife said, you can spend all of our money, but don't touch the house. So I never mortgaged the house. I'm still married, thankfully. <laughs> but this was tough. I didn't understand one thing. I thought my customer was the drummer. I'm a drummer. I was making it for drummers. In the 70s, where did drummers buy their drumsticks? Music stores. As a manufacturer of drumsticks, my customer was the music store. And music stores hated this product because they lasted too long. They lasted 45 times longer than wooden drumsticks. And they wanted drummers coming in every week to buy sticks because they'd always buy something else. My customer, I didn't understand who my customer was and it caused me to go out of business. <sighs> so this is my definition of lean based on that experience. Lean is simply a production practice of searching out all activities that do not create value for your customer and your customer's customer throughout the entire supply chain to the end user and then eliminating those wasted activities. Henry Ford had this figured out in 1922. He would hire farmers and put them on the production line. He said, I believe that the average farmer puts to a really useful purpose about only 5% of the energy he expands expense. Not only is everything done by hand, but seldom is a thought given to a logical arrangement. A farmer doing his chores will walk up and down a rickety ladder a dozen times. He will carry water for years instead of putting in a few lengths of pipe. It is waste motion, waste effort. And of course Paul has redefined this and this slide is incorrect because it says seven waste. That's what we were talking about, Clorox. <laughs> 
Paul has added number eight. Okay, let's say it together. Number one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. And the important one, number eight. Yeah, that, that's a biggie. So let's look at a packaging line, for example. There are suppliers and customers in this entire su uh, supply chain. So here you have a supplier, the unscrambler is supplying bottles to the filler. And the filler has the outside supplier, that's the, that's the liquid, and he also has a supplier for the bottles. So he, the filler is the customer for the unscrambler. The capper is the customer for the filler. The, ca the capper is receiving bottles from external source and they're receiving the filled bottles from on the line. It's supplier, customer, supplier, customer, supplier, customer. It's the entire supply chain. You need to meet the requirements of everyone in the entire supply chain. <clears throat> this I see way too often. You'll see that the camper operator adjusting the machine because he has out of spec caps come into the machine. Those caps should never come into the factory. They should be rejected where the caps are being made, not come into the factory where the operator has to adjust the machine to run those out of spec caps. But I see this everywhere. We need to engage vendors and talk to them about lean and get them involved and learn about their process so that we can help them so that they never deliver out of spec products to our line because that's just wasted effort. So we have, we have suppliers and then it has to transport to, to us and then we assemble and then sometimes we'll have a warehouse um, and coming out of the warehouse we transport it, go to the end user. Who has interviewed the truck drivers to find out what their requirements are? <laughs> you know, they would like to see these pallets a certain way, a certain direction to make their life easier. We need to meet the needs of every person in the entire supply chain. Eliminating waste means all activities do, that do not bring value to everyone in the entire supply chain. So what happens if we don't meet our customers' requirements? Hi, how are you? Two light soft tacos and a diet soda. What kind of soda do you want? A diet soda, diet Pepsi. Pepsi? No, we don't have Diet Pepsi. I have a Dr. Pepper. A Diet Dr. Pepper? Sure. Uh, we don't have Diet Dr. Pepper. Okay, I'll just have any kind of soda. Well, I, I have to know what kind you want, ma'am, so I can tell you we're out of it. Taco Bell, what do you want? Is there a manager back there? Hey, uh, this is the manager. My name is Dave. I'm the manager. What can I do for you? I'm just listening to you talk to the people, and you're being a little... Did I? You're being a little rude to some of these customers. Uh, my parents are both rude. Uh, are you the manager of this store? Uh, <clears throat> Ma'am, you're talking to Dave, manager of the Taco Bell. <laughs> what would you like to eat today, ma'am? I'd like two, three cheese milk. Okay, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not exactly a computer. Slow down. <laughs> ago and the damn thing rolled over my foot and I lost three toes. <laughs> chance to get anything to eat. Can, can I ask you to get me a little something to eat? Yeah. Here's how this will work. Uh, you order for me a burrito supreme, okay? For you? Yeah. Okay, what would you like, ma'am? I told you the green cheese and beef milk. Anything else? And your stupid thing, whatever you want, but I'm not saying. <laughs> I don't pay for it. If you have to order it, all right, it's a burrito 
Rio Supreme with no meat. Okay, try it again. What else, ma'am? Rio Supreme with no meat. All right, fine. Thank you very much. What's the total? That's uh, 2680. <laughs> <laughs> the real total is 2680. The Burrito Supreme is a little pricey. <laughs> with no meat. Is that correct? She's gone already, Chief. you know who your customers are and you endeavor to meet all of your customers' requirements, reducing waste everywhere throughout the entire supply chain, you'll never have to say about your customers, they're gone already, Chief! <laughs> Thank you very much, God bless you. Stay up here for a minute. We've got five minutes. Anybody have any questions for Ron? Of course. Yes. Greg. What do you think I'm thinking? I think you're thinking, uh, why don't you introduce them now with the internet? Yes! <laughs> um, you don't want to bring up this. Um, I know what, what, it, it was tough. Uh, we used all of our money to develop this. Uh, three years of time. Um, it was tough going back to it after, I, uh, after this venture. I, uh, I joined the Clorox company and stayed there for 24 years, and my wife was thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> what did you spend? How much? <laughs> yeah, it was a Kickstarter campaign, uh, Global Lean Leadership Summit Kickstarter campaign. Well, Any other how, questions? How much did you spend? How much did you spend? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. Um, in order to pay off the debts, uh, I sold just about everything. I had a coin collection since I was a little kid. I had to take that in and sell it. Uh, I mean, it was, it, it took a long time to pay off all the debts I had incurred in the development. It was painful. So fast, I was only selling it. <laughs> <laughs> now, yet all the manufacturing, when I, when I was doing it, the manufacturing is, it exists in the U.S. Now it's all moved offshore to China. So oh. it would be, oh, okay, yes. What materials? I used a, a, an epoxy impregnated fiberglass. I had to experiment with a lot of different weaves, a lot of different epoxies because of the impact strength. The way I would test it, uh, I wouldn't waste my time going to a drum set. I might get distracted and play drums. So I just used the edge of a file cabinet and I would hit it as hard as I could. At the end of that three years of testing, that file cabinet had a dent in it about <laughs> six inches deep. <laughs> but that's how I tested it. Wow. One minute right there. Let's say you want to uh, throw your dream in a landfill. Throw my dream in a landfill. Uh, it's because uh, all of the orders were being canceled. Um, the, the sticks were being returned from the music stores because they didn't want this product to exist. So I, I then tried to license it to drumstick manufacturers. They didn't want it either because they like selling products that produce waste. <laughs> They were making a lot of money producing waste. Does anyone come on the market with anything since then? Yeah, I just saw um, there's some companies that look like they're kind of copying what I did. I'm not sure. I haven't tested it yet. I don't know exactly what they're doing, but it looks pretty close. Uh, my patents have expired. I'd have to, uh, and, and there's some other things that would have to be developed to uh, to make those make new patents, building on what I had done. You know, I'm just struck by how deep learning, when you were sharing with me over the phone, I was down, um, I was down at the ballpark which we're heading to tonight, and I was just listening to the story, and I'm like, you know the depth of learning that happens when you mess up? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You never forget it. You never forget it, right? No. And the bigger mistakes teach us more deeply, right? The right. ones that hurt deeply, the ones that you had to go into debt for, the ones you had to beg forgiveness for, yeah. those kinds of things sit in our minds, and you will never forget the lesson that it's every customer that matters throughout the supply chain, right? Exactly. Now, the, the ideas around the room of how to, to decrease the complexity of the supply chain are great, but that's not the lesson. 
Right? The lesson is, wow, how powerful it is to learn from our own mistakes. And if we forget one step along the process, one customer downstream, right. if we forget the guy who's packaging the goods at the end of the line, and we think that it was great job up at the front of the line to fix it, we just made a great job, but it mess, messes with his, it's not an improvement. If it decreases his, if, if it doesn't have value throughout the whole chain, at least if you're not, at least determining what that looks like. So thank you for that. I've never looked at the truck driver's perspective, and I will now forever. Thank you, Ron. You're welcome. Yes.